Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about some of the changes in attendance records in college football. There has still been a little bit of an uptake in attendance even with all the changes going on, but 2024 seems to be the one that will tell the tale on that one. But let's jump into my version of a State of the Union. Uh, college football is under a crazy amount of changes right now. There is a ton of stuff going all over the place. And 2024 is the year where a lot of that stuff takes uh, hold on college football. Uh, a lot of uh, the stuff that we have been somewhat dreading uh, for some of us, some uh, looking very much forward to it, but a lot of stuff is happening this year, and a lot of stuff is going to be happening this week. So I figured let's update you all on where we are now, and then we'll get to the, the craziness as it kind of unfolds over the next week or so. Um, but right now, there's a ton of stuff happening. Um, we have conference realignment, coaching changes that are absolutely huge, uh, playoff changes coming, uh, rule changes, transfers, everything that you could possibly think of that could be changing about the sport, excuse me, is changing about the sport. So it'll be interesting to see how all of this kind of affects the fan bases, um, affects the attendance records that we just talked about, but for right now, let's just break it down. Let's uh, go nuts and bolts, give everyone kind of a one-stop shop to get updated on everything happening in 2024, and then we'll worry about 2025, 6, 7, all of the craziness that could happen down the road a little bit later. But uh, for right now, let's start in conference realignment. I know there are a ton of teams moving a ton of different places, and I feel like I've said it a lot, but I think there are still some people that are very confused about what is going on, and that makes total sense. So let's just break down where everyone's going and kind of the implications of all of this. So Texas and OU, as we know, as we have known for a couple of years now, are heading to the SEC this year. Um, a huge addition, obviously, for the SEC anytime you can add teams like Texas and Oklahoma and brands like Texas and Oklahoma, it's an absolute win. Uh, for the Big 12, they had to replace uh, some teams. They did add um, UCF, Cincy, Houston, and BYU this past year um, before Texas and OU had left, but then a lot of stuff happened, uh, including the Pac-12 starting to kind of crumble before our eyes uh, last offseason, and the Big 12 took full advantage. They added Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and Arizona State to the new uh, Big 12 going into next year. An absolutely huge uh, decision for Brett Yormark and that group. I think <clears throat> if you were to ask me who has handled this conference realignment stuff as incredibly as anyone in college football, Brett Yormark would be my answer because there were a lot of college football fans, there were a lot of Big 12 fans in particular that were not that did not like Texas and Oklahoma. I don't think that needs to be told to people, but there are a lot of people that wanted them out as soon as possible. And Brett Yormark made that happen and struck up a deal with them, got them out of the conference, which I think works for both sides. I don't think anyone is upset about that um, at Texas and Oklahoma. I don't think anyone's upset about that in Lubbock, Texas by any means. So adding Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and Arizona State, they might not be Texas and Oklahoma. In fact, they're definitely not Texas and Oklahoma. But at the end of the day, they're all very good products. Utah <clears throat> plays good football week in and week out, year in, year out. Colorado is one of the emerging brands. Arizona played incredible football last uh, last year and is trying to build off that. And Arizona State is doing <clears throat> awesome things under Kenny, Dilly Kenny Dillingham. It's taking a little bit of time to kind of build out his vision there, but I think he's going to get there uh, fairly soon because he's just a very talented guy and has a lot of passion for the game. So big fan of him. Um, the Big Ten also took part in the mass exodus of the Pac-12. They snagged up Oregon, Washington, UCLA, and USC. So kind of the big dogs. Uh, they took the big names in the, in the Pac-12 for sure. Oregon, is the team that everyone has their eye on in the first year of the Big Ten because, in my eyes, they're a top-four team in the country and a top-two team in that conference. So they should be right in the mix for everything. I think Washington's in somewhat of a rebuilding year. UCLA breaking in a new head coach and USC 
breaking in a new philosophy um, entirely. So a lot of changes going on at the other three, but Oregon is the team that uh, the Big Twelve te- or Big Ten teams, excuse me, will have to uh, definitely worry about a little bit more than the others uh, going into this year. And then we had a couple of uh, stragglers at the end of the Pac-12 process with Stanford and Cal. They found their way to the ACC, so they went as far as possible away uh, from the Pac-12, and SMU is actually joining them from Dallas. There was a lot of speculation that they might join the Big 12, but Big 12 never seemed very interested. They already have TCU in the Fort Worth, Dallas area, so maybe that factored in, but SMU has found its way to the ACC and might not be a long-term home, but we'll find out all of that as we go along on this. Um, So, the Pac-12 became the Pac-2 very quickly. Um, they will play Mountain West Conference uh, opponents this year, Oregon State and Washington State. Uh, that is so still a ton to like about all of these conferences, right? It's just a little bit different. Uh, they're a little bit bigger. They're a little bit, um, a little bit more all, all over the place. Some of the games that look like out of conference will be conference games this year, so um, just wanted to give you a little breakdown of all of the changes that are happening there because it's been a lot of them and they're all coming into fruition this year and it's a little confusing at times. So, uh, just wanted to keep you all updated there. I think the ACC will be the next conference that will have a big turnover as the Florida State and ACC battle, if you will, uh, kind of starts to come to an end, but, Uh, we will update you that as we get there. For 2024, that is where we're sitting with all the conference realignment. Um, But also, this offseason gave us a ton of coaching changes. Uh, There were not a lot of people that thought we were going to be in the position we are right now with all of the changes that have been bouncing around um, every which way, but it all started with Nick Saban retiring. He was the person that kind of set off a lot of dominoes around college football, and it started with Kalen DeBoer coming from Washington to Alabama. Obviously, Washington coming off a national title year was not an easy decision for Kalen DeBoer, but it's Alabama, so you got to take the chance and uh, bet on yourself in that one. Uh, Washington replaced DeBoer with Jed Fish from Arizona, and then Arizona replaced Jed Fish with uh, San Jose State's Brett Brennan. all very, very good hires, in my opinion. Brett Brennan, I am a little bit more skeptical of just because coming up from the San Jose State level to the Arizona level is a totally different ball game. But uh, he has coached in the Pac-12 before, so I expect him to be off and running. And with no Fafita there, you can accomplish a lot of things. So um, that will definitely be an interesting thing to watch. A couple of high-profile guys that took over for huge uh, names in this game is Jim Harbaugh headed on to the NFL after flirting with it for the last couple of years. He is now the head coach of the LA Chargers, uh, the team that he used to play for, well, San Diego Chargers, who he played for, but still the same franchise. Uh, And Sharon Moore has decided to, um, or they have decided that Sharon Moore is their new head coach. This was a no-brainer, was a interim coach for four years in 2023, so makes total sense. Uh, someone that they all trust in that building that understands what Michigan football is all about. So I don't think this one took very long for anyone at Michigan to make that decision. Uh, and then finally, Mike Elko is the new head coach over at, uh, in College Station at Texas A&M. He takes over from Duke. Uh, he was the DC under Jimbo Fisher for a couple of years before taking the Duke job. And Jimbo Fisher is retired, it seems, Uh, kind of just hanging out. Maybe we'll be back in the game at some point, but if I were him, I would live out the best job in the world, which is a fired college football coach, because the checks keep rolling, you get to sit and fish all day. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily blame him if he decided to clock out and permanently clock out. Uh, If I was Jimbo Fisher, I'd do the same thing. But uh, that's about the big uh, coaching changes. There were a ton more, but for right now, that those are the ones that will really impact the college football space in 2024. But now let's get into the playoff because there's a ton of stuff happening, especially this week. It feels like um, there have been talks that if a deal is not struck by this week, we might have a lot of things happen that I don't think anyone wants to see happen 
including possibly the SEC and the Big Ten deciding to take their ball and play elsewhere, uh, which is something we do not want to see. Of course, it's not something that I don't think any of us uh, are big fans of, but it's something that could definitely happen. Uh, There are so many different things happening around college football and these playoff discussions that it feels like the SEC and the Big Ten kind of want to, um, as it were, take their ball and play elsewhere, stealing that a little bit from Josh Pate there. But uh, it makes sense that they want to do that, I suppose, but they're doing everything they can to keep them intact. It'll be interesting to see how this week plays out. Right now they're at 14 teams. They've had tons of auto bids at one point and then no auto bids at one point that we talked about yesterday. I think 16 teams has been thrown out there. So we don't really know what the future holds with the playoff, but we know what holds uh, what the playoff holds for 2024. And that is a 12-team playoff with a 5 plus 7 format, which essentially just means five auto bids um, from the four power conferences likely and then one group of five champion. It kind of, there is some, you know, leeway there, obviously. It's the top five ranked um, conference champions, but those tend to be the top five ranked conference champions. So uh, those will likely be the teams that will get the bids there. And then the seven at-large bids are totally up in the air. Uh, The SEC and the Big Ten could dominate those. Uh, It could be kind of an evenly split. It'll be interesting to see how the playoff committee kind of deals with the you know, we know the SEC and the Big Ten are bigger conferences and are more competitive in a lot of ways. So it'll be interesting to see how they weight that compared to an ACC team that's ten and two compared to a SEC team that's eight and four or something like that. So it'll be interesting to see how all of that comes to fruition. But for right now, it's a twelve team playoff. A lot is going to change in the next forty eight hours to seventy two hours, but Uh, For right now, I just wanted to get everyone an idea of what's going on with the playoff because there are a lot of headlines going around that I'm sure are confusing a number of people. But uh, let's jump into some rule changes and some transfers real quick. Um, Rule changes, it looks like helmet comms are coming into college football. I love this decision. I think a lot of people are in favor of this, uh, offensive play callers especially, even though they did not want to stop at where they did. Uh, Currently... The rule has one person on either side of the ball at any given time, so one offense, one defense for either uh, team will communicate with a coach up until 15 seconds left on the play clock. There were tons of coaches that really, really wanted this to have multiple people with uh, mics in their helmets, multiple, uh, whether it's wide receivers or running backs or whatever, and then they also wanted it to go all the way up till zero because apparently that's what happened in... Uh, the bowl games, and there were a lot of coaches, especially offensive coaches, saying it made it so easy. Uh, There was ability to just kind of, uh, as Josh Pate put it, play game, uh, play a video game in front of his eyes, you know, play a video game in real time, because when you can communicate all the way up to the snap, there is a a lot of ability uh, for the um, coaches in that scenario. But Right now, it's only 15 seconds left on the play clock. Tablets will also be on the sidelines, so um, I'm in favor of both of those rules. I think it makes a ton of sense. Uh, There is also going to possibly probably be a two-minute warning um, is expected to make its way to college football this year. I don't necessarily love this one, but I felt like this was something that was always going to happen. You know, commercials are a a big draw for these uh, media companies, so this was not necessarily a big surprise to me, but... Not necessarily the biggest fan of that one. But uh, let's jump into some big-time transfers. There are a million big-time transfers, but I have a couple here that just just to get you an idea of where the big names are uh, coming into this year. DJ Uyunglele uh, kind of kicks us off here, coming from Oregon State as the Pac-12 kind of crumbled around him after his one year there. He decided to take make his way down to Tallahassee. So he is the um, play call, or he is the quarterback for Florida State. He is the guy that will be calling the shots uh, under center. So a huge addition for Florida State with uh, Jordan Travis going out the door. I think both these guys are cut from the same cloth, and I really like the fit with him and uh, Alex Atkins, the OC there. So 
I love that one. I think Cam Ward going to Miami from Washington State, another casualty of the Pac-12 crumble, but he has found his day his way to Miami or to Florida and down to Miami. Uh, so he has kind of joined DJ Uyunglele in their travels down to the Sunshine State, and I think Cam Ward is going to be an incredible piece for this Miami team. They were missing uh, elite, consistent quarterback play a year ago. Tyler Van Dyke struggled big time in a lot of the games that were close, including that uh, Tech game that we have talked about a couple of different times that got away from them inexplicably at the end. But uh, moving on, we have a couple of guys going to Ohio State that are huge difference makers on either side of the ball. Caleb Downs, I've said a million times now, I think he is the best player in college football. He is heading to Ohio State from Alabama. And then Quinchaw Judkins, another SEC star from Ole Miss, is heading up to Ohio State uh, to be a running back right next to Travion Henderson, an elite duo. Uh, Maybe we'll do running back duos in the next Top 10 Tuesday, but we'll get to that next week. Um, Texas uh, added Isaiah Bond on the outside. They obviously needed a ton of replacements for pass catchers with Xavier Worthy, A.D. Mitchell, and Jordan Whittington walking out the door, and getting Isaiah Bond is absolutely huge for Texas. Um, as long as him and Quinn Ewers can get on the same page, I think they could be an absolutely lethal duo this upcoming year. And then Oregon absolutely cleaned up in the portal. They have four guys here that are just absolute game changers. And let's start with Jabbar Muhammad because he is the only defensive guy in this group. Um, he is a huge shutdown corner that was at Washington a year ago. I tend to believe that he could have gone to the draft and been among the top corners in the draft, but decided to come back to school is going to Oregon, which I'm sure some Husky fans are not too excited about, but his decision to make. Um, They also added uh, Jamari Caldwell on the defensive side of the ball, who is an absolute beast at defensive line coming from Houston. And then the offense just exploded. Uh, In the quarterback room especially, Dylan Gabriel and Dante Moore, both quarterbacks that were starting a year ago, both quarterbacks that are very talented. It's incredible that they were able to get them both in a room, but... Dylan Gabriel will be there for one year, and then Dante Moore will likely take over, and I think Oregon is in for a great couple of years of quarterback play, I'll put it that way. And then uh, Evan Stewart, adding that wide receiver from Texas A&M, is as big of a pickup as they possibly could have gotten. Um, Him next to Tez Johnson is a lethal duo, and I cannot wait to see what they can do uh, together on the field, especially with a facilitator like Dylan Gabriel uh, under center. And then some other guys, we had Walter Nolan make his way from A&M like Evan Stewart, but he made his way to Ole Miss. He is a remarkable defensive lineman, probably one of the best, if not the best in the country of interior defensive linemen, is an absolute game wrecker and could take Ole Miss to the next level because a lot of what they have been missing is that interior trench help that Walter Nolan should bring in droves. So it'll be very interesting to see his effect on the team and if he can kind of be the missing piece to get Ole Miss over the hump in the SEC. And then let's talk about offensive linemen. Caden Green making his way from Oklahoma to Missouri. He was a remarkable uh, freshman last year for Oklahoma, was incredible on that left tackle side, and Missouri is incredibly happy to have his services. And Oklahoma fans were not so happy to see him leave. There were some uh, contentious conversations, to say the least, between Missouri and Oklahoma fans during that time, but... Caden Green has a new home in Columbia, Missouri, and it'll be very interesting to see what he can do. I think he's going to start, I know he's going to start right away. I shouldn't say I think. Um, And with him uh, protecting Brady Cook, they absolutely need him to perform to the highest level. And he's a guy that can play as good as anyone in the country. So very excited to see what he can do. And then Trevor Etienne, brother of Travis Etienne, the incredible Clemson running back, has made his way from Florida to Georgia, which is something that I really didn't think I would see uh, very often, but here we are. There is a guy going from one rival to another, and it'll be very interesting to see what he can do at Georgia because they were kind of thin at running back there for a time. Uh, Branson Robinson had an injury that they're very excited about that kid, and he's going to be very talented, but they needed another dude, and getting Trevor Etienne in that room was absolutely huge, so I think he's going to be one of the biggest impact uh, transfers in the entire country this year, and possibly even a Doak Walker on his way. But 
tons of incredible guys across the country, tons of changes across the country, and they're not stopping anytime soon. This week is going to be wild around the playoff and possibly what the SEC and the Big Ten's future look like. But for right now, I wanted to get everyone caught up before everything goes crazy over the next couple of weeks. So uh, those are all the updates that I have for the time being. We're going to take another short break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk recruiting again. We did uh, the 2025 offensive side of the ball yesterday. We're going to jump into defense, some incredible guys in this class, including Elijah Griffin, who's kind of setting the pace for everyone else in this group. But uh, stick with us, and we will be right back. 